It's great to be together with all of you and to be beginning a new series uh, over these next uh, three weekends uh, together today. Uh, one of the responsibilities of a pastor is to make sure that the people of God have a balanced diet. Now, just think about what that means in terms of uh, what we eat and our food and so forth. There are five basic food groups, uh, vegetables, fruits, grains, dairy, the proteins, meat, uh, fish, and nuts, and so forth, and poultry. Um, and each of these different groups contributes in a distinctive way to the overall health uh, of the body. And so a balanced diet is one in which you have, you take in in proper proportion um, the benefit of each of the parts of uh, each of these different food groups that contribute to the health of your body. Now, what is true in regards to the body is also true in relation to the soul. Remember, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's why whatever we're doing, we're always coming from the Word of God. But as all of you know, the Word of God itself has different parts, and just as there are different food groups, the different parts of the Word of God uh, contribute to the overall health of a Christian believer, and therefore we need to be exposed to them, we need to be taking them in in proportion for the sake of our own spiritual health. Now, earlier this series, we did, a, 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 this year rather, we did a series uh, on the subject of contentment. Um, that was a series that focused on Christian character. It was really about what a Christian experiences. This series that we're beginning today is of a different sort. It's about Christian doctrine. In other words, it is about what a Christian believes, and especially what a Christian believes in regards to the law, to grace, and to the Christian life. So I want to invite you for that reason to turn with me to Romans and chapter 7. And over these three weeks that we have uh, together in these three campuses, uh, we will read the whole of this marvelous chapter, Romans and chapter 7. But in the preaching, we're going to focus especially, not exclusively, but especially on the first six verses. Now, a good place to begin with uh, any new series is to kind of outline some objectives, really some aims as to where we're hoping to go and where we hope to be as a result of these next three weeks. And I want to suggest uh, three aims for this series. These are the things that are in my mind and in my prayers as I've been preparing for it, and roughly they will correspond to the three weeks in this series together. And these are the objectives. The first is that we would better grasp the doctrine of union with Christ, which is central to the whole of the Christian life. And that will be our focus particularly today. We're going to look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 4 today, where we have this wonderful statement that we belong to Him who has been raised from the dead, that is Jesus, of course. Why? In order that we may bear fruit for God. So if you ask the question, question, how can I bear fruit for God? Answer, by union with Jesus Christ, by belonging to Him. That's what the apostle says in Romans in chapter 7 and verse 4. And I think that um, not only is the doctrine of union with Christ uh, the central theme with regards to living the Christian life, it's, it's also an often misunderstood or less understood uh, truth, and therefore it's important for us to try and better grasp it. That's the first objective for this series. The second is that we would better understand why Christianity is more than a sustained effort at living a moral life. Now, please remember, and especially if you're new to church, I want you to understand this clearly. There is a vast difference, a vast difference between Christianity as we find it in the Bible 
and simply a sustained effort to live a model life. And I wonder, for anyone who's a Christian, I want you to think about this, could you explain clearly what the difference is? Really important that we can. Many people don't know that there is a difference at all. They have the idea that if you are a Christian, uh, what that means is that you commit yourself to pursue a good and a moral life. And of course, that is true, but if that is all that it is, well, an atheist could do that. An atheist can commit to pursuing a moral life. You don't need Jesus Christ to make a commitment to try and pursue a moral life. People all over the world from every kind of background do this. Uh, so, while it is true that Christians are committed to the pursuit of a moral life, for sure, there is nothing uniquely Christian about that. And if all that you have is a sustained effort to pursue a moral life, you have not yet discovered the joy, the peace, the love, the power that Jesus Christ is able to bring into the life of a person who belongs to Him, to use the language of the Apostle Paul here. And that's at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. So, it's really important for us to understand this, and that's the second objective. And the third really flows from it, which is that we would therefore taste and savor the freedom and joy of an authentic Christian life. And I think that Romans in chapter 7 is actually one of the most important, but also one of the least understood chapters of the Bible. Now, growing up, I heard something that some of you will have heard, and so I just want to say it, and then we'll get it out the way so it's not a distraction to us. Growing up, I often heard this phrase that somehow as a Christian, you've got to get out of Romans chapter 7 and get into Romans chapter 8. Hands up, everyone that's heard that phrase. Quite a number of us, a few of us around here uh, at least. Well, um, if, if you have heard that or if you were brought up with teaching like that, uh, you will be saying already, what in the world are we doing in Romans chapter 7 if what we really need to do is to get out of Romans chapter 7 and get into chapter 8. So, I need to answer that point, don't I? And here's the answer. We are going to taste and to savor the freedom and joy of an authentic Christian life in Romans chapter 7. This is the chapter where the Apostle Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus Christ our Lord is all through Romans in chapter 7, which deals with this issue of the law, grace, and the Christian life. So, I want to say, if you feel depressed, if you feel discouraged after reading Romans chapter 7, you simply have not understood it. But if when you have read Romans chapter 7, you find in it a fresh joy in Jesus Christ and a new energy for serving Him and for pursuing the Christian life, then you really have understood and have grasped what this wonderful chapter of the Bible is all about. So, with that introduction, I do hope that all of us have our minds and our hearts and our Bibles open to receive from the Word of God as we find it in Romans and chapter 7. Now, the title for this series, A Second Marriage, comes from the analogy or the illustration that Paul uses here in the first verses. I read from verse 1. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Now, very clearly here, the Apostle Paul is using an illustration and obviously, any illustration in its nature has its limitations. 
If any illustration is pressed too far, it will become at some point confusing. But illustrations are tremendously valuable to us, and under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, the Apostle Paul uses this one here because it really is like a wonderful window that brings light to the heart and to the understanding in regards to this important subject that is before us today. Now, the point that Paul is seeking to illustrate is clear in verse 1. The point is that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So, Paul's saying, for the purpose of illustration, think about your relationship with the law as if it were like a marriage. So, for the purpose of illustration, Paul is speaking of the law as if the law were a person. And more than that, as if the law were a person to whom you were bound in a marriage. And because he is picturing the law as a person, I'm going to give this person a name. I'm going to call this person nomos, which, as some of you might know, is the Greek word for law, and that's why I chose that name. Now, what is it like for you to be married to nomos, or as Paul puts it here, for you to be bound to the law. Well, think about it. The law makes demands. Nomos is a character who is never satisfied. However hard you try, you can never live up to nomos's expectations. So, when you're married to Nomos, you do not have a very happy marriage. Are you following me this far? It is a miserable marriage. It is not a happy marriage if you are married to someone who's never happy, never pleased with anything you do, never satisfied, always making demands. Think about what this is like. You can never get to the place where Nomos, your spouse, is pleased with you, even when you have done your best and you hope that Nomos will be pleased. Nomos has thought of something else that you've not yet done and is never satisfied, and so on. So, to be bound to the law is like, in Paul's illustration here, it's like being locked into a really unhappy marriage, except that it's actually even worse. To be bound to the law is actually like being stuck in an abusive relationship. Now, some of you will have read John Bunyan's marvelous book, The Pilgrim's Progress. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, please read it. It's marvelous. You will love it. Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress really gives us a kind of allegory of the Christian life. In other words, he gives us the Christian life in pictures and in symbols and in illustrations. And so, what the Pilgrim's Progress is, for those who don't know yet, is it's the story of a person called Christian who lived in a place called the City of Destruction, leaves the City of Destruction, and begins a journey that's going to lead to the celestial city. So, the whole thing is really a picture of the Christian life. And at one point in the story, Christian meets up with another believer whose name is Faithful. And the two of them, as Christians often helpfully do, begin to share stories about how they have faced various temptations and trials and how they have got through. So, Faithful tells Christian about how he came to the house of an old man called Adam the First, who lived in a town that was called Deceit. He lived in a luxurious home, and he had three very strikingly beautiful daughters. And he said that if Faithful would come and work for him, that he could marry any of these three strikingly beautiful daughters or all three of them together if he wished. That's what he said. More than that, 
He said, if you will stay and if you will work for me and if you will marry into my family, you will inherit all the luxuries of my house. Everything that belongs to me will one day be yours. And faithful, as he's telling the story to a Christian, says, you know, at first, at first, I was inclined to accept his offer. But then, he says, the thought came to me that this old man actually wanted to make me his slave. And so, faithful, coming to his senses, changed from his first inclination, his first impulse was to go with all the attraction that was offered to him. But he comes to his senses and he says, no, no. Um, he says no to what first attracted him. And at that point, the old man becomes really angry. And he says, now, if you won't do this, if you won't stay in my house, you won't marry into my family, I'm going to send someone after you and he's going to make your life completely miserable. Well, Faithful said, I've got to go. I'm committed to being a pilgrim. I've got to continue on my journey. I've got to get out of the town of deceit. So he leaves the town of deceit. And sure enough, someone comes running after him. And when this man catches up with Faithful, man he's never seen before, this man takes a swipe at him right in the stomach, bends him over double. Faithful tries to catch his breath, looks up at the man and says, why did you do that? Your first inclination was to go with Adam the first. Then he hit Faithful again, this time over the head, knocks him to the floor. Faithful's on the ground, looks up, and he begs for mercy. But the man says, the law knows no mercy, and then kicked him on the ground. At this point, Faithful realizes that he is in serious trouble. And so as he's telling Christian the story, he says, I felt sure that this man, whoever he was, was going to kill me. But just at that moment, a second man appeared, and he commanded the first man to stop. Christian said to Faithful, do you know who that second man was who commanded the first man to stop? And Faithful said, I didn't know at first, but as he passed by, I saw that he had scars in his hands and on his feet. And then Christian said to Faithful, do you know who that first man was who was hitting you and beating you up and who you thought was going to kill you? Christian said, I'll tell you who it was. That man, his name was Moses. His, the law spares no one, and the law shows no mercy. My friends, I've taken time to tell that story because I think that if you reflect on it, you will find it is a story that every Christian can personally relate to. The inclination to sin is within us all, so that even if by God's grace you end up saying no, as faithful did, to what you were first inclined and drawn towards, what you find is it's not long before the law sneaks up on you and begins to beat up on you and say, well, you know, even if you said no, you were still inclined in that direction, which just shows what you are, doesn't it? The law is always beating up on us. And if it was not for the man with scars in his hands and on his feet, the law would certainly leave all of us for dead. So, to come back to Romans in chapter 7, the person who is bound to the law, to use Paul's phrase, or married to nomos, which is what we're talking about, is not only in an unhappy place, but actually in a dangerous place, a desperate place. To be married to nomos, 
would mean living with someone who makes constant demands, is impossible to please, and often beats up on you. And so long as you were married to Nomos, as we're following this illustration of the Apostle Paul's here, so long as you were married to Nomos, you could never be at peace. You could never possibly be at rest because in your conscience there would be a constant beating up on yourself, and that's where it comes from. Now, for how long will you be bound to Nomos? For how long would this miserable marriage last? Look at verse 1 with me, please. The law, Nomos, is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Oh, your whole life, no relief, unrelenting. This marriage to Nomos is till death us do part. There's no getting out of the obligation that we have to the law of God. As long as you live, bound to the requirements of the law, bound to the demands of the law, and bound to the penalties of the law. There is no way that you can divorce nomos. The only way, the Apostle Paul says here, the only way in which this marriage ever comes to an end is through death. It is till death us do part. And nomos is never going to die. You know, if you're in this state, you might say, well, let's send Nomos for a health check. Let's hope that he has a heart attack and falls over sometime soon, you know. But Nomos will live longer than you will. Nomos was here before any of us were born. Nomos will be here long after any of us are gone. Not one dot of an I or cross of a T will pass away from God's law, the Lord Jesus Christ says. Not ever. So there is only one way out of this miserable marriage. And since Nomos is never going to die, there's only one other option that you should die. It's the only way out. And that is where we come to the marvelous words of Romans 7. That's why I say, if you haven't found the joy of Jesus Christ in Romans 7, you haven't understood it yet. Let's look at it phrase by phrase, what he says. Likewise, my brothers. Now, he's applying what we learn from this analogy. So, here the Apostle Paul is talking to Christian believers He's telling us, brothers, sisters, what we need to know about ourselves and about our standing in Jesus Christ. Look what he says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. That's the most, mar that's a hallelujah moment, isn't it? It's a marvelous statement in the light of what we've just been considering. You are no longer bound to the law. You are no longer locked into this abusive relationship with Nomos. You are no longer married to Nomos. And the reason for this is not that the law has died. That never happens. No, the commandments of God stand forever. The reason that you are no longer bound to the law is not that the law has, bound, has died. It is that you have died. So that naturally raises the question, how in the world can that possibly be? How can it meaningfully be said of a of Christian believers sitting here in the church today that we have died? Well, he answers that question. Look at it. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. How? Through the body of Christ. Now, here we come to this marvelous truth of the believer's union with Jesus Christ. 
that we are made one with him in his death and in his resurrection so that what was true of him actually becomes for those who are in Christ true of us as well. This is what Paul is getting at when he says in another place, I have been crucified with Christ. That's Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He, here's what happened. When Jesus died, all who are made one with him through the bond of a living union that is forged by faith, we died with him. Uh, Romans 6 spells this out in terms of saying, we died with him in regards to sin. Romans 7 spells this out in terms of, we died with him in terms of and in relation to the law. And then something else that Paul speaks of here also, when Jesus rose, all who are made one with him through the bond of a living union that is forged by faith, we also with him rose to a new life. We became new people. We were regenerated, born again is another way of saying this. The power of the Holy Spirit came to live within us. We are not who we were before, no longer married to Nomos, no longer the slaves of sin. Sin was your enemy, but no longer your master. So Jesus died so that through his death we might also die and finally be released from this miserable marriage to Nomos from which our death was really the only way out. And if it had not been for the man with the scars on his hand and on his feet, Nomos would have been the end of us because we would have been bound to Nomos all of our lives and before the judgment throne of God and therefore condemned to all that Nomos brings for all eternity forever. Now, notice what comes next, because God's purpose for all of his people is even more than saving us from getting beaten up by Nomos. Look at the last part of this wonderful verse. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, and here's the further purpose that God is bringing about, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. In other words, God's purpose in delivering you from this miserable marriage to Nomos is to bring you into a new and wonderful union with his son, Jesus Christ, that you may belong to another. You can't belong to another in terms of Paul's analogy, so long as the bond to Nomos remains. That one's got to be broken. It's broken as you died and rose with Jesus in order that you may belong to him, to him who has been raised from the dead. Now, friends, I hope that it is now absolutely clear to every person what is the difference between being a Christian and simply a sustained effort at living a model life? A sustained effort at living a model life, by definition, is a sustained effort at pleasing nomos, which, as we've seen together, is never going to succeed, however hard you, you try, because nomos is never satisfied. This is the transformation that is at the heart of being a Christian, and it comes through union with Jesus Christ who died and rose, and when we come to him in this bond of faith, what happened to him actually changes our whole position in regards to life itself. Now, just thinking about this, and many of you will be able to think about other examples that are like this. But Karen and I are close to someone who made a very bad choice and then found herself in an abusive relationship. And it was a miserable marriage. And it lasted for some years. And 
then the marriage finally ended, and when it did, we were all so relieved. We had been so anxious. And then something else happened. She met and married a man who really loved her. And since then, her whole face, her whole life, her whole health has been entirely different. There's a light, there's a joy, there's a peace, there's a contentment about her. She's a different person. And she's living a completely different life. Now, that's the illustration that Paul is using here. And do you see how it gets to the heart of what it means to be a Christian? And the transformation that this involves? Let me put it to you this way. Here's what's at the heart of being a Christian, and here's why it all revolves around Jesus Christ and why Jesus, therefore, is the center of all of our love and praise and trust and rejoicing and all of our hope. It's all Him. Because, you see, all that has happened to us as Christian believers is because of all that happened to Him. That's at the very core of the Christian faith. If you're a Christian, you can say this, all that has happened to me, all the good that has come to me is because of all that happened to him. What has happened to us? Forgiven, dying to sin, getting free at last from the miserable marriage to Nomos. How did these things happen to us? They happened to us because of what happened to him. He died. No hope for us otherwise. Just lifelong misery, whether we realized it or not. And what else has happened to us? New life has come to us in Jesus Christ, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a new hope. We have a future of unclouded joy in a new heaven and a new earth in the presence of a holy God with whom we have been brought to this wonderful peace. And how has that happened? Christ rose. and Therefore, He's brought us into this marvelous new life with Him. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this wonderfully well, and I quote, We are not saved by teaching. We are not saved by ideas. Don't talk about this wonderful idea. No, no, no. We're not saved by teaching. We're not saved by ideas. We're not talking about theory. I continue the quote. We are saved by the fact that the eternal Son of God came into this world, that He was born of the Virgin Mary, that He died on the cross, that He was buried in the grave, that He conquered death, that He ascended to God, and He is seated at God's right hand forevermore. Everything that has happened to us is because of what happened to Him. That's why we're going to come around the Lord's table here with full hearts, thankful hearts, and say, Jesus paid it all. And if it wasn't for the man with the scars in his hands and in his feet, we'd all be dead in the road and we'd be lost in an eternity of condemnation forever and forever. Then notice just finally how our verse here ends. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Here is a very strange thought for parents. If you had chosen a different spouse, you would have had different children. That is a very strange thought, but it's true. Remember now that Paul is using an illustration here. We must not press it too far, but the general point is clear. Being bound to the law brought out the worst fruit in us. We'll look more fully at this next time, God willing, but marriage to nomos never produces good fruit. It always brings out the worst in us. Paul says, you've died to the law so that you may belong to Christ who's raised from the dead in order that you may bear fruit for God. 
and the good fruit of a life that is pleasing to God does not come from a sustained attempt at living a moral life. It comes from union with Jesus Christ who died and who rose. It is the life of Jesus Christ in you. This is what he meant when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. It is the very presence of Christ in you that gives the hope of good fruit coming out of a life even such as yours and mine. So here's where we conclude today. I wonder what you know about these things in your own life. Here we are coming to the Lord's table today. And there may just be some of us who feel that we should not take the bread and the wine because we're not really fit to come. You know your own sin. You feel your own failure. You often feel condemned. Just remember this today, please. The voice that condemns you is the ugly voice of Nomos. And here is what you need to know. When you are in Jesus Christ, you are no longer bound to Nomos. You need no longer listen to his accusations. The man with the scars in his hands and on his feet commands Nomos to stop. Commands him to stop. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you come, not because you have some sense of being worthy of being at the Lord's table, but because this in Jesus Christ is precisely all that you need. And I end with this thought and with this invitation. As Paul has used the analogy of a marriage, I find it helpful to think like this, that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was asked the question, will you take sinners of all sorts, of all ages, of all types, of all backgrounds, will you take sinners and will you be their savior? And in an agony of death, the response of Jesus Christ to that question was, I will. And I have today the great privilege of therefore saying to you, will you take Jesus Christ? really. You come to church. I want to ask you, will you take Jesus Christ, forsaking all other? Keep only to him so long as you shall live. Because if you will bind yourself to Jesus Christ in the bond of a living union, if you will trust yourself to him, if you will give yourself to him today, then I promise you, if you will have Christ, your sins will be forgiven. If you will have Christ, you will be released from the oppression and condemnation and this miserable marriage to Nomos. And if you will have Jesus Christ, you will be brought into the freedom, brought into the joy and into the peace of what Paul pictures here as a wonderful new and second marriage in which the Spirit of Jesus Christ lives within you. I cannot think of anything more marvelous or more glorious, but this is what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you, offers to all who will come and bind themselves to him in faith today. Lord Jesus Christ, we lift our hearts to bless you and to praise you and to give thanks. Apart from you, we see today that we have nothing at all, but in you all things. And for this, we give you our thanks and our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.